Hans Langsdorff, commander of the German pocket battleship Graf Spee. At the beginning of World War II, he sinks British merchant ships at will. Graf Spee becomes Britain's public enemy number one, and Langsdorff a target for the most powerful navy in the world. Commodore Henry Harwood will be his opponent in the first great naval battle of World War II. Langsdorff is wounded, his ship severely damaged. As she limps into a South American port, her captain faces an impossible decision. Hitler will accuse him of cowardice as he tries to save his ship his crew, and the honor of the fatherland. For 70 years, Graf Spee has kept her secrets in the mouth of the River Plate. Today, the strange truth of her downfall can be revealed. The naval harbor of Montevideo, Uruguay. On this foggy morning, the crew of the minesweeper Audas are preparing to go on patrol. Their destination, just a few nautical miles east of the capital. The Uruguayan Navy are caretakers of a sunken memorial to a great sea battle that took place here 70 years ago. As usual in the southern winter, visibility this morning is less than 300 meters. But there's an appointment these sailors must keep with the wreck of the Admiral Graf Spee. At a safe distance, the Audaz anchors and her divers prepare for their regular inspection. They have to make sure the wreck is holding together no guns or turrets breaking off into the channel to endanger shipping. In 2006, the Uruguayan Navy declared this a closed zone. And their patrols have a second purpose, to deter neo-Nazi souvenir hunters. It's tough work here. The strong current can carry away inexperienced divers. Underwater, you can see about 30 centimeters, all too easy to lose your bearings. Now, plankton carpets the battleship. But computer reconstruction reveals what the coastal waters obscure, the scale of this 186-meter colossus. She lies rusting, eerily complete, after more than 70 years in the silt in the mouth of the River Plate. The result of a bitter decision taken on December the 17th, 1939. The Graf Spee was born out of a dilemma. Engineers at the Imperial German Naval Yard have to build new battleships for Germany. Battleships she's not allowed to have. This is their solution. The plans of the Admiral Graf Spee. After losing the First World War, Germany is forbidden any ships over 10,000 tons. The result? The pocket battleship. The first three are soon being built. With the firepower of a warship three times their displacement. Nothing like this has been tried in naval history. With pocket battleships, Germany will once again be a great power, without breaking the rules set by the victors of World War I. 
chief among them, Britain. Naval historian Jan Michael Witt has studied the thinking behind the building of these ships. The strategic concept behind the Graf Spee was this. It must be faster than any ship that was more heavily armed and more heavily armed than any ship that was faster. And this ship would be used to wage commerce warfare. It was specifically designed to attack enemy merchant ships. The concept was truly revolutionary. A closer look will show what this ship was capable of, identify her strengths, and reveal her Achilles heel. She was perfectly suited to her role as high seas pirate. Even her hull is innovative. For the first time on a ship of this scale, it's not riveted, but welded. A smoother surface means less water resistance and a great saving in weight. But to keep the weight down, the designers also sacrifice vital armor plating. Graf Spee is powered by diesel engines, not the usual steam turbines. Eight nine-cylinder motors provide more than 55,000 horsepower, giving the Graf Spee high speed and enormous range. An awesomely effective power plant, but complicated and untested. Graf Spee is a thoroughbred, a racehorse of the seas. Like a racehorse, she will need constant care and attention. This ship is a high-speed gun platform. Two turrets fore and aft, six 28-centimeter guns with a range of 22 kilometers. Smaller caliber guns, and anti-aircraft guns complete the picture. But the guns can only target one enemy at a time. One flank will always be vulnerable. Combine that with her light, almost non-existent, armor plating. Spee must be a buccaneer that will hit and run. The ship is two years in the building. By the time she's finished, the Nazis have seized power in Germany. Suddenly, the pocket battleship has a new role to play. She must be a showpiece for the regime. And yet, as storm clouds gather over Europe, the job of commander of this great ship goes to an unexpected candidate. The man who takes command in October 1938 is Captain Hans Langstorff, a decorated veteran of World War I, but no ardent Nazi. Langstorff entered the Imperial Navy as an 18-year-old cadet. After World War I, married and with children, he served in Berlin at the war office. By the mid-1930s, he has a reputation as a brilliant administrator. But he hadn't joined the Navy, defying his parents in the process, in order to end up behind a desk. He saw himself as a sailor and as a warrior, but one with a conscience. According to family tradition, he should have become a priest. So this other ambition, to become a naval officer, rather took the family by surprise. But I think that growing up in a strictly Protestant household had a powerful influence on him and stayed with him his whole life. Langstorff has little sympathy with the Nazi government in Berlin. He applies for an active service posting as far as possible from the capital. 
he's given command of the most prestigious ship in the German Navy, the Admiral Graf Spee. It's like winning the jackpot, the most modern ship of her times, the chance to take her out onto the high seas and show what she can do. And when Captain Langsdorff came on board, it was rather a novelty to have such a young commander. He came to us with an impressive reputation. We all had a picture of what he would be like, but then there he was, a good-looking young officer. We greeted him with all due respect and soon held him in high regard because he was so loyal to us and he knew exactly how to deal with people. From the start, Langstorff treats officers and men with equal respect. Sweeping aside class distinctions, he welds his crew of 1,100 into a single team. Langstorff soon has a chance to test himself and his ship. With Europe in a state of high tension, Spee is sent on a secret mission. The crew have no idea where they're headed. Only Langstorff has that information, and he starts the voyage with a deliberate feint. Langstorff sets sail northwards. Three days out, in the middle of the North Atlantic, he turns south. Graf Spee is to disappear in the vastness of the ocean. German military archives hold a document that helps throw light on Langstorff's controversial decisions in the coming weeks. This is the captain's log of the Graf Spee. The log makes it clear that when the Graf Spee left harbor on August the 21st, 1939, Hitler already knew war would break out 10 days later. Germany's hidden mobilization has started. The Graf Spee's wartime mission is to attack British merchant ships in the southern oceans. As an island, Britain was dependent on the supply of food and raw materials from overseas. That was her Achilles heel. So, of course, it was Langsdorff's aim to cut these supply routes to decisively weaken Britain. With colonies on four continents, half a world from the mother country, Britain's trade is extremely vulnerable. But there's a second part to Langstorff's role. If Graf Spee forces the Royal Navy to send its warships to the South Atlantic, they'll be weaker in the Channel and the North Sea, just when the Germans plan to invade Britain. So Graf Spee has orders to run amok, sinking as many British freighters as possible. There's just one complication. Britain and Germany are not yet at war. So the ship must hide and lie in wait. For Langstorff's crew, it feels more like an innocent holiday under the tropical sun. These are hardly men straining their sinews for war. The ship's band plays on deck every day. The loudspeakers blare out German hits. Many of these men are away from home for the first time. Langstorff lets them enjoy this moment of peace. He knows they'll be fighting soon enough. Cool, not 
On September the 1st, 1939, Hitler makes a radio broadcast, accusing Polish troops of attacking Germany. That day, German forces invade Poland. The Second World War has begun. Langstorff does nothing. He's been told to remain hidden off the African coast. Hitler is convinced Britain will not go to war over Poland. Britain's declaration of war took Hitler completely by surprise. His foreign minister, Ribbentrop, had promised him that Britain would not get involved. When the British declaration of war landed on the cabinet table in Berlin, Hitler turned to Ribbentrop and said, what now? The German high command waits three more weeks. On September the 26th, they finally authorize commerce war against British merchant ships. Spee will not have to wait long for action. Sailing west, bisecting Britain's trade route with South America, Spee intercepts her first victim. A shot across the bows brings her to a halt. Her crew fear for their lives. But Langstorff takes them prisoner before sinking their ship. He follows the rules of war with every attack. But not every British captain accepts the situation. When he sank the Africa shell, Captain Dove came on board, wearing his short trousers and, uh, what's it called? a solar topi, and he came on board and said, I was inside the three-mile limit. No, said the captain, you weren't. You were outside the three-mile limit, otherwise we wouldn't have stopped you. No, I wasn't. And they had a little argument, and Langsdorff said, come into my cabin. And he showed them the chart. We were here, and you were there. You see? Oh, all right, we'll sort it out after the war, Captain Dove said. Langsdorff treats his English counterpart like a trusted friend. He had a very special relationship with Captain Dove. It was as if he had found a man after his own heart, a man he could really talk to. Graf Spee sunk the Africa shell in the Indian Ocean. Now she swings back into the South Atlantic. Langstorff has sown more confusion as to the Spee's location. Twice a day, Langsdorff sends up the onboard seaplane to seek out new targets. The plane flew a triangular course. It would recce the route the ship would be taking in the course of that day. Then, it flew back and signaled to Speer the coordinates of any enemy freighter it had sighted, its bearing and distance. All the Speer had to do was follow those directions to the British target. The Arado 196 is launched by catapult and winched back onto the ship after its patrol. This plane is only a prototype. The engine needs constant repairs. Finally, it packs up altogether. But there are still enough targets out there for Spee's torpedoes. In the first week of hostilities, Spee sinks 14,000 tons. By the end of October, that figure has doubled. In London, the Admiralty starts to get extremely concerned. A month later, 
Without killing a single sailor or betraying his ship's location, Langstorff has sunk nearly 50,000 tons. But like his ship, the captain has a weakness. Langstorff was a very pleasant man. Clearly, he got on very well with his British prisoners who had a lot of respect for him. He was a good seaman. He was very aggressive, and that was his big problem. He wrapped up inside him was that deep frustration that every German naval officer felt, that individually they might be able to defeat the British, but the British always had much greater strength. Langsdorff's instincts were to take risks, and he took one risk too many. The pocket battleship always manages to escape unseen, hiding in the vastness of the ocean. She moves so fast, the British can't even work out if they're facing one enemy warship or two. The Old Admiralty in Whitehall, London. The nerve center of the Royal Navy. This is where it all comes together, the intelligence, the sightings from friendly or neutral ships. The wires are running hot. Graf Spee must be found. But there isn't even enough information to decide which area to search. The Admiralty sends out eight hunting groups to find Graf Spee. German strategy is paying off twice the Royal Navy is being drawn away from home waters. British warships are now looking for one pocket battleship. The Graf Spee's log confirms that Hans Langstorff is aware of the danger facing his ship. Yet on December the 6th, 1939, he carries out a searchlight practice because his crew had made a mess of their previous attempt at a night attack. Graf Spee's lights are visible for miles, a dazzling display in the South Atlantic from a battleship that is supposed to stay invisible. Suddenly, a lookout spots an unlit freighter on the horizon. Langstorff can't identify it as an enemy vessel. He lets the freighter escape. Two serious mistakes in one night. The Norwegian merchant ship signals the presence of the battleship to London. The Graf Spee is steaming towards South America. The Admiralty diverts one heavy and two light cruisers to intersect Langstorff's course. The Exeter, the Ajax, and the Achilles. Under the command of a dangerous strategist, Commodore Henry Harwood. Commodore Harwood was the worst possible enemy for Langsdorff and the Graf Spee. He had studied how you dealt with pocket battleships before the war. He even lectured on it at the Royal Naval War College at Greenwich. He was the, the British anti-pocket battleship expert. Langsdorff was really putting his head, albeit unknowingly, into the lion's mouth. Harwood is prepared. He knows that Spee is a floating fortress far superior to the ships in his own flotilla. So instead of spreading his ships to seek the enemy, he will keep them together. He gambles that Spee will look for prey close to the mouth of the River Plate and the great ports of Montevideo and Buenos Aires. He concentrates his flotilla there. He plans a pincer movement. Exeter will attack from one side, Achilles and Ajax from the other. He knows that Spee can only target a ship on one side, Hans Langstorff is short of time. Spee must return to Germany for a refit. But his logbook reveals that he wants one further success, an attack on an armored convoy. Then he could sink enemy ships without warning in a real battle against express orders from Berlin. And sailors will die.
Langsdorff was a naval officer. That means he was a soldier first and a seaman second. As an officer and a soldier, it was his aim to inflict as much damage on the enemy as possible. His own humanity had to take second place. When German intelligence reports a British convoy off the coast of South America, Langsdorff sees his chance for the crowning act of his mission. The morning of December the 13th, 1939. Perfect visibility, calm sea, battle weather. 6 a.m., the watch reports smoke columns and mastheads on the horizon. Langstorff rings full ahead and directs his battleship towards what he believes is a British convoy. The expected freighters turn out to be heavily armed British warships. Langsdorff was told there was one light cruiser and two destroyers. In fact, he was facing one heavy cruiser and two light cruisers. Langsdorff decided to attack what he thought was a weaker adversary before they pursued him. Langsdorff believes he has no choice. If he tries to flee, the faster enemy cruisers will cut him off. Within minutes, 1,100 men are at battle stations. By engaging the British, Langstorff is flouting Berlin's direct orders. But his next decision is the fatal one. Given the first two mistakes that Langsdorff made, of looking for trouble and when he found British ships engaging them. What perhaps he might have done, what the British feared, was that he would stand off at long range and use the advantages of his big guns. In the event he didn't, he closed to short range, which gave the British cruisers a considerable advantage, helped, of course, by the fact that at the crucial moment, his forward turret stops firing. So at the beginning of the action, the crucial minutes, he only has half his armament. His gamble had really failed. Spee's guns have a range of 22 kilometers. Langstorff closes to well inside that distance. Suddenly, Spee is vulnerable. The British fire salvo after salvo and launch torpedoes in an all-out attack on Spee. Langstorff tries desperately to zigzag, to no avail. In the 1920s, Langsdorff had commanded a flotilla of torpedo boats. That means he thought like a destroyer captain, and that's exactly how he commanded the Graf Spee, like a destroyer, using her mobility and her ability to change course quickly, to turn away from the enemy and evade their torpedoes. But by doing that, he threw away his real advantage, his heavy artillery, far superior to anything the British possessed. The battle continues in the South Atlantic for over an hour. The pocket battleship is attacked from both sides, taking casualties. This ship is not impregnable. The missing armor plating takes its toll. A flat turret took a direct hit between its two barrels. There was absolutely no trace left of the gunner inside. We cleaned it up with a fire hose. There was nothing left. The explosion had simply vaporized him. But Spee has hit home, too. We concentrated on Exeter first, until she was knocked out of the battle and broke off. Exeter had more than 70 dead. She was on fire. And then the commander turned to deal with the two other British cruisers. But 
By then, Ajax and Achilles had been able to close on Spee. That was when we took all the punishment. By eight o'clock in the morning, the battle is over. The ships break off. No one knows who has won. The British don't know how severely Langstorff's ship has been damaged. Aboard Spee, the captain sees only one option, to make for the nearest deep water port. Montevideo was the suggestion of Langsdorff's navigation officer. People always say he should have gone for Buenos Aires, upriver in Argentina. But the problem was, the river plate was full of mud. That could have jammed the intakes of the water cooling system and ruined the engines. And then the ship would in effect have been lost. Slow ahead, Langstorff steers towards harbor. Ajax and Achilles shadow the limping giant at a distance of about 16 nautical miles. Langstorff is confident of getting help in Montevideo. Uruguay is neutral. According to the Hague Convention, it must allow the Graf Spee essential repairs. Spee is anything but ship shape. Her complex diesel treatment plant is damaged. She's holed above and below the waterline. She needs all the time she can get for repairs to have any chance of making it home to Germany. But Uruguay is neutral only in theory. She's economically dependent on Britain. Millington Drake happens to be British ambassador. He wants Graf Spee expelled. German ambassador Dr. Otto Langmann will do all he can to get permission for Graf Spee to stay as long as possible. The odds are stacked against him. Montevideo's small German community, listening in on their own local radio station, can't offer their compatriots any help. The newspapers are full of speculation about British reinforcements and an ultimatum to quit the port. The next day, December the 14th, bodies are brought ashore from Graf Spee. Hours later, Spee's British prisoners are given permission to land. In Montevideo, they are free men. Not a single prisoner has been killed in the battle. While Langstorff visits the German embassy, Millington Drake is negotiating with Uruguayan officials. They will insist Spee is ready to leave. He was quite certain he couldn't sail out with the ship in that condition. He wanted the government in Montevideo to give him a week for repairs. Then Spee would have been able to run at full speed and they would have provisions for the Atlantic crossing. Everything would have been ready. The German ambassador receives the ultimatum. Graf Spee must depart by December the 17th, just four days after her arrival. 
da die uruguayische Regierung schon so England von England Since the Uruguayan government was so heavily influenced by Britain and put under constant political pressure by Millington Drake. With hindsight, it was a political miscalculation to try to stay. In the event, Uruguay allowed Schbe to stay just two more days. That was completely inadequate. On December the 15th, a funeral is held for the German dead. Then Langstorff has to face his surviving crew. And he came on board and told his officers and crew that there was no hope of getting safely out of the harbor without another battle. And we only had 168 shells left for the big guns. And they wouldn't last more than an hour. And we wouldn't be able to cross the Atlantic and get through the English Channel to Germany. We all knew that. Another battle against the British can have only one outcome. There's no hope. The men write home. Across the city, a young German immigrant describes the strange standoff. Now we hear that a whole British fleet has assembled at the mouth of the river, waiting for the Graf Spee to leave. They're caught in a trap. The news spreads. Spee is leaving. On December the 17th at 6 p.m., she glides out of the harbor. Langstorff has made his plans. Spee is carrying a skeleton crew. Hans Eubel is one of just 40 sailors on board. As we left harbor, I dismantled the warheads from six armed torpedoes. Each was about one meter 50 tall and contained 300 kilos of explosives. Langstorff will not give the enemy their victory. The captain wanted to stay on board when the ship blew up, but the officers with him said, no, no, come on, sir, we'll get in the boats and then things will sort themselves out. They virtually stopped him staying on board. He would have gone down with the ship. We'd moved away about 20 minutes when the explosion happened. The commander sat on the port side of the boat with his head in his hand, and you could see what was going on inside him. An American newsreel crew films the burning battleship. She blazes for three days before sinking. But Langstorff has cheated the enemy. They did not sink his ship. He has secretly transferred his crew onto tugs and from there to a German freighter. It will take them upstream to the Argentinian capital, Buenos Aires. At that moment, we all realized that the captain had given us our lives back. We were all relieved. We'd lost our ship. We didn't know what was coming next. But we hoped somehow we'd make it back to Germany. The Hotel de Immigrantes in Buenos Aires. In peacetime, the first stop for would-be immigrants to Argentina. Since the war began, it has been empty. The new home for Graf Spee's crew. 
Langstorff has one further responsibility to his crew, to ensure the authorities accept them as shipwrecked sailors, the only way they will escape internment. But in accordance with international law, neutral Argentina must keep the sailors prisoner. Their one concession is to allow the men to live with German families in Buenos Aires. But they have no prospect of making it home. And of this way, and the captain addressed us and told us he was more than satisfied with the conduct of his crew and that we would manage from here on. Today, the wreck of the Graf Spee lies just beneath the surface. British frogmen dived to the ship hoping to salvage vital military technology. But the German demolition crews did a good job. Every sensitive piece of equipment had been destroyed by hand. The Maritime Museum in Montevideo has relics salvaged from the Graf Spee, this 15 centimeter cannon, and an artillery rangefinder. Reminders of a time when the whole world was watching the city on the river plate. Langstorff takes full responsibility for the loss of the Spee, but South American newspapers are calling him a coward. On the evening of December the 19th, he writes to his wife, it must be clear to a commander with a strong sense of honor that in circumstances like these, his own fate is inseparable from that of his ship. I have put off carrying out my decision while I still had responsibility for the well-being and safety of my crew. In his room in the Hotel de Immigrantes, Langstorff lay down on Spee's battle flag, his last act as captain. He said, the exact words are important. We shall show the world what German honor means. At the time, I didn't really understand what he meant. Of course, the captain believed that. And the next morning, we heard the news of his death. Langstorff's suicide is global news. Early in the war, it still has the power to shock. He had taken the decision as soon as he realized that he couldn't sail his ship back out. If he did, everything would be lost, the ship and her crew. Or I can sink the ship so that it doesn't fall into enemy hands and save the crew. And then, according to the traditions of the service and my own sense of honor, I can do nothing but follow my ship. The captain of the Graf Spee was buried with full military honors. Thousands of mourners filled the streets. His crew accompanied the coffin. Members of the German community, ordinary Argentinians, even a few Britons, paid their respects. There were seven cars with wreaths. It was amazing how the people of Buenos Aires were affected by the captain's death. And from then on, we felt a bit like orphans. Hans Langstorff is buried in the German cemetery in Buenos Aires. The Nazis used his funeral as a propaganda coup. No one said Langstorff had anything to be ashamed of. Yet his widow was never granted a full pension. Hitler later accused him of cowardice for not going down with his ship. But the lives of his crew meant more to him than blind obedience and loyalty to the fatherland. The Argentinian Navy helped most of his crew escape from internment and return to Germany to fight on. Hans Eubel stayed on in Argentina 
still grateful to the captain who saved his life.